Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Big one today, Ed. Masamuni Shiro's Ghost in the Shell, a classic, epic graphic novel and manga and anime and movie and everything else. This is going to be fun to dive into, but uh, let's talk about your comics first. Yes, uh, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Issue one of Red Room is completely up there right at this very minute. Uh, so three bucks will get you the complete archive. It's a story about uh, a world where murders are streamed on the dark web for fun and profit in a totally anonymous fashion and what are the ramifications of that who are the people that would participate in that how where do you get your victims from stuff like it's a very dark story very apropos for for halloween perhaps more apropos than ghost and show even though it has the term ghost in the uh, title i like that the murders are done for fun and profit yes. not just profit look at that man. that's <laughs> that guy's no he's not long for this world that's poker face everybody i want to see cosplayers dressing up like uh, my poker face character. It's just football pads with spikes, kind of like the LOD, and a very cool looking mask. And if you're going to scan something in, uh, use bicycle playing cards, because they have the more iconic uh, suit shapes. <laughs> my latest, Octobriana 1976, world's first blacklight comic, is out everywhere and almost sold out everywhere. Uh, it's also available in digital format on Comixology and on my website, jimrug.com. You can also pick up the 350-page uh, process zine making of both on Comixology and my website. So, October on in 1976, everywhere you get comics. Where do you start with this, Ed? I discovered it uh, from Wizard Magazine. There was a little mini-comic insert in one of the issues in, say, the 40s, maybe, and it would be the first color piece, the complete first color section of uh, volume one, of issue one. Uh, not complete. Like, it would be the part up to, you know, you get the violence and then you get the girl. You get up to this part. And this... Kind of the iconic, uh, the disappearing girl yeah, against the, the city. Yeah, the cloaked camouflage uh, armor. Um Blew my freaking mind. Uh, I didn't get Appleseed comics uh, before that, but when I saw that, um, I I had to get this thing. But Ghost in the Shell, like, this is the first comic ever that I proactively, because of the wizard coverage, I knew it was eight issues and then it was going to be collected. So I deferred to just getting the, the actual trade. You waited for the trade. The first time I ever did that. Like, <laughs> you were way ahead of the curve on that. 1995 or whatever, like my money was, was, was so tight. And this, in fact, like $25 for the trade was substantial, very substantial to me. Um, but I made that plunge. And my relationship with this comic, uh, you know, I read it every other year. Like when I finally grabbed it, I was like uh, super excited. When I gave it a read, I sort of put it down and was like, well, maybe it's for people smarter than me. You know, they had so many things that I liked about it. And I revisit it every couple of years, a wiser man, more worldly. And I always tell myself, like, this is the time you're going to crack it. I've never cracked it, Jim. Yeah, I have that same kind of response. I did not hook up with it that early on. Uh, I actually read the Dark Horse collection. This is my version of it. Uh, you can see from Half Price Books, pretty beat up, well read. Um, I read this for the first time maybe 10 years ago uh, on my first vacation in about 10 years, and it was wonderful. It was a great experience, but definitely, like, this is a... It does stuff to your brain reading it. <laughs> it it's really... I love that, you know? I mean, like, like we've been reading a lot of these bigger books lately, and the reward... You know, it, it, it's a whole experience reading this. It's mm -hmm. very unique. Like, you think of reading a book or something, and this is so far removed from that in that there's a lot of information streams that you're getting as a reader in this. There are a lot of stories in this book. It's a very unique reading experience compared to even other graphic novels that we've read. Yeah. And I love that part. You know, it does feel like parts of my brain are used reading this that, that you know, don't normally get much use. Uh, in terms of the story, some of it's certainly more coherent than other parts. Um First thing I'd say is, you know, this is a, a cyberpunk Bible. Absolutely, yeah. It's like you have you have uh, Akira that kind of set a kind of a template, and then you have Ghost in the Shell that kind of p picked up what, it, what that laid down. He's a unique creator. I want to show off some of his stuff, uh, because this is not the first thing in English that happens. He's one of the early manga guys who really had a lot of his work, maybe all of it, translated into English. And so, like, 
He's Appleseed is probably the first thing we all know him from here in in English. Yeah, grab that right there, man, because that's his first that's his first comic period, man. And this Black Magic was uh, published. Go through that was was uh, published as a doujinshi, uh, and I did not know that. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, so then it was uh, it, a, a fan con an amateur press publication for people watching at home. Yeah, and I think he stayed in that mindset for his entire career. He's very unique compared to any other mangaka of, of his stature uh, because, you know, the, like the Gero stuff, for every one Gero comic that you know that has transcended that magazine, there are maybe 50, 100 guys who you've never heard of because it's, you know, it's fan press almost. It's, you know, nobody's asking you to do that and you're not getting paid. Uh, but he said, he put together this doujinshi it caught the eyes of like some real editors who could give him more of a chance. And Appleseed comes comes very comes right after that. Um, he doesn't use assistance, and he so the his entire body of work that you describe as being like you know out there, it's a manageable body. I say that when you see a crazy page like this, but it's a manageable manageable body of work for a single creator. You know, it's you know two three thousand pages, which. A, a single person could do, but then you see this and it's... Well, like, you mentioned Akira. You know, I think it's worth recognizing when this is created, that the, kind of the era and uh, maybe what was popular at the time. You can see, I think, that influence and certainly a similar audience, I think, would gravitate to this that would come to an Akira. Dude, this has blown my mind because uh, when when I was setting about becoming growing up to become a cartoonist, like I drew, I copied this whole first, wow. uh, first chapter of... Appleseed to try to like crack this code because I was super into this. Appleseed is far more uh, coherent. But um, once again, Shiro does not use assistance. He's putting pen to paper on everything. Every line is his. That's unbelievable. And, something this detailed. And I was looking this up and I couldn't corroborate. I couldn't find, uh, I couldn't find, I can't cite any sources, but I think that his work is so kind of fully formed. I don't think he uses this, uh, editors. I think it's like a, t a take it or leave it. Uh, proposition because his manga doesn't read like anybody else's. I think if he had an editor um, going over it, I think it would be far more uh, coherent. Perhaps that's why Appleseed is more coherent. I, I don't know, but um, this Lovecraftian bits in this in this comic. And this is Dark Horse. So he starts at Eclipse. Uh, Eclipse goes out of business, I guess, but. There's still a demand for his work, continues to be translated, finds a home at Dark Horse Comics, who does Ghost in the Shell. And this is an issue of the first Ghost in the Shell series, as Ed mentioned, uh, eight issues total. This is issue seven. These are kind of hard to find. I don't see a lot of these whenever I'm going through, uh, you know, 50 cent boxes or anything. Perhaps everybody was waiting for the uh, trade. <laughs> that or else, you know, people snatch them up. You know, the people that are reading this, I, I don't know if they're uh, folding these back into comic book stores whenever they're selling their collections. This is one of my favorite pages like this is the little silent sequence uh in this in this issue yeah absolutely beautiful too the color work that he does um goes on to do digital work you know even in the sequel to ghost in the shell he's working digitally in the color sections so like not only a guy who's very singular in his production but also interested in media and working in these different methods yeah and and honestly the digital it's too bad because the richness and the warmth of his painting, whatever he uses, because it is not Copic markers. Uh, it, it's it's too bad that you know we we lost that, but we at least have it, you know, in here. I'm gonna start flipping through this, and we can just kind of continue this conversation as we go along. But you know, I wanted to illustrate with those other books that, like, as big as Ghost in the Shell is, he had already kind of been established here. You know, Huge. As, as a guy that was coming on and being translated, like he had been translated for years before Ghost in the Shell came to English. And, uh, you know, I guess catapulted him to yet another level of stardom. Yeah, I, I had I had the uh, the Appleseed anime. Uh, th that might be my first thing that I got with his name on it. I want to point this out. This is your, like, AI neuro activity. This is the, the brain of the AIs. Uh, pretty wild stuff here. This would be the sequel version of that, where we're seeing it even more as, like, electrical impulses and things coursing through there, the evolution, I guess, if you will, of this technology. This has produced the original Ghost in the Shell, 89 and 90, I believe, is when it was originally serialized and then collected in 91, English in 95. But you think of this as like 
Think of, remember 89 yeah. and 90 as we're going through and talking about this stuff because this is still kind of cutting edge. I, these absolutely. ideas of AI and where they're going to go. It's, it's really mind-blowing to think of like reading this in the late 80s. I don't know how you would even make sense of it. <laughs> reading it now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Super cool design though. You know, I mean, you fall in love with that character design the first time you see her. For She's sure. the coolest character in this book by miles. He's a great... A uh, designer of all sorts of stuff, weaponry and shit like so. Like these suitcase guns are freaking cool, and you'll see you'll see many different kinds of munitions and weaponry. Those cool spider tanks and uh, shit like that. This, by the way, is um, Kadansha published this edition is like a three volume hardcover collection box set. Is, is what I'm looking at here. And so it's an unflipped version of this story compared to the Dark Horse uh, version. It's re-lettered. Yeah, and, and also, like, they account for the spine as well because the Dark Horse uh, trade, unfortunately, they, they print close to the spine and you have to really crack it open to read the stuff close. I'll say this about the Dark Horse edition. It's Tom Warzakowski lettering. Yeah. And it's a little bit bigger lettering. Mm -hmm. I like that. My old eyes appreciate it. But also, Tom Warzakowski lettering looks great. But the reproductions are really good. Mm -hmm. There isn't enough space in the gutter, but otherwise, the reproductions are good. The color and the black and white are sharp. So yeah. both editions pretty nice in that regard. We're going to see, you know, this is a violent series. Lots of people, uh, those great weapons that he draws, they're not going to waste. We're going to see those used on all, all kinds of characters throughout. Um, the other difference with this edition is the sound effects are still in the original Japanese. They're not, they're not uh, re-lettered like the Dark Horse edition. Yeah, so... When you jump in, each you you mentioned it was an eight issue miniseries, and there are about eleven or twelve chapters. But sometimes these chapters are two pages, and uh, the eight issue sequence, like each each eight, eight issues, is kind of an episode of a story. You know, like there there's a broader universe, but there's a kind of complete story that's told within each yeah. episode. And in my reading experience, here's the thing. Masamuni Shiro, he's the exception to very, very many rules that that I sort of have as as a reader. And I don't think he gets to be who he is if the artwork isn't kind of second to none. I, I don't think that readers would put up with a lot of stuff that he's delivering us because of the sort of... Uh, incoherence of some of the story it's like if you have incoherent art and incoherent story like like what are we doing here my my brain has a similar trajectory in every episode and it's one of confusion <laughs> for uh a, a big chunk of it and then when you zero in on the more kind of like action element or like the 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 traditional plot part then i'm on board you know and i sort of give myself to Shiro to to um, tie it all up for me. He doesn't really. <laughs> yeah, these are. Um, I would describe them as procedural. They're a crime fighting unit. They're not exactly a police force. Uh, you know, they kind of exist outside of the police. They're like a special forces group that has I don't know jurisdiction over all kinds of stuff, it's international like criminals, things of that nature. But they operate sort of like a police task force, especially these early. Uh, stories. They're kind of set up as like somebody's breaking the law. They're going in to, you know, right some wrong, to expose something or whatever. And most of them are built in that episodic nature. So it's a matter of, okay, what's, who, who's at fault? Who are they chasing? What's the crime? There are all these pieces. You're right. You know, it, it kind of comes together or maybe doesn't totally come together uh, throughout that story. But that's a big chunk of how these are built. This is a good spread to be on to kind of talk about uh, for by my perception of his work, he could give a fuck about character. You know, Major Kusanagi is who we all know, but give me give me five traits of her or something. You know, good 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 luck. And uh, it's the world that matters to Masamuni Shiro. The, it's the it's the political sh structure of this world. It's the way technology works within it. And you saw all that all that marginalia it's I was hoping to find some more as we kept going but it, i may have flipped by that one too quick it's it's him just selling like 
he knows more about this world than you do, and he doesn't want to draw, say, 50 pages to describe this right here, so he'll just tell you. Yeah, and it's it's a wide range of what this covers. So, like, this note is about the uh, artificial blood that is used in these androids being white blood. And sometimes they're just, I don't even know what, an idea that he's showing off, like, oh, I have this idea about it. Yeah. But other times, it is it will cite something. You know, like, it may be based on real AI concepts at the time, and he'll cite, like, a specific book. It, you know, it's a footnote, like an academic footnote, where it's like, for more on this, you know, go to this this book, or this book is only in Japanese so far. You know, it's, it's a real hodgepodge of what's in there. And I actually have... Um, some notes about it, you know, like that commentary covers everything from almost director's commentary where he's talking about some of the tech and weapons, uh, you know, to very out there kind of theories on on things. And uh, I think there's literary comparisons to postmodern formal writing like David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest that's like half citations and notes and footnotes and things. Um, House of Leaves is another one from 2000 that was like all of this meta information and I, I see it in this, you know, it's a different tone, of course, but it's pretty broad, it's pretty interesting, and it's clearly the author addressing the reader. It's it's kind of amazing. Like, when I talk about this being a unique reading experience, these footnotes are a big part of that. If someone's going to make an argument for there being editorial involvement, it is probably relegated to just that. I only feel like a fly on the wall. Like, I only feel like I'm watching... I'm, I'm stepping into this future world and watching stuff happen. And, and I don't know the rules of this future world. The uh, footnotes kind of help me a little bit if they don't put me to sleep. Yeah, the other footnote comparisons, I think, are of like From Hell, the annotations in From Hell at the back. And uh, Chester Brown annotates a bunch of his work. So like from a comic standpoint... I think there's some similarity, especially with Chester Brown, because a lot of that stuff is like personal notes about, you know, where he was at, what made him draw this. And you get a little bit of that in here. How about this for just, we're, we're reading cyberpunk. That's a beautiful forest. Oh, absolutely, man. Secrets of mana level stuff, man. And, and the camouflage, you never see camouflage really work. And, and it kind of looks perfect right there. Yeah, I would say these are your other two major characters yeah uh this is bateau who's kind of uh the major's right hand man confidant um you know trusted ally on this team and then this is your commander of of this uh special forces unit yeah once again you don't get much from uh in terms of character study but bateau is like he's he's the most relatable one to me or at least he has the most character throughout this this book this is uh so, you know, the ghosts in the shelves, the ghosts refer to linking up basically to these brains, AIs, operating systems, all the stuff, you know, that hackers would invade. And so uh, whenever Bateau and, and the Major are connecting, she's like on, I don't know, vacation kind of leave and gets called back into work and connects with Bateau through a mind link to let him know like where she's at or to, you know, transfer information efficiently. She's in the middle of like having sex with, with these women and it's something that he can't process as a man. <laughs> so that's the footnote is about how he's suffering because his brain is receiving sensory signals from an organ he doesn't even possess. <laughs> it's real fun ideas. They remind me a little bit of um, like Kirby doing sci-fi where he would talk about doing like 30 years into the future. And if he did any further, it would just confuse readers. It feels like that when I read this, like these concepts, like I said, they're still futuristic today, 30, you know, 30 years later maybe a little bit easier to understand or think about, but it's incredible to think of like conceiving this 30 years ago. For sure. He, I mean, he's, he's clearly got a different set of tools than your average cartoonist. And he has a, a genuine interest in this field. I imagine like when he's not sitting down making comics, like he's, he's reading up on the subject, you know, he's got a subscription to Wired Magazine Japan or something. And, and probably every gun publication ever uh, ever available. Draws a good gun. And it, it, Both of these footnotes are about guns. This one is about how the uh, shells are discharged and like a, a catcher on the top of this gun that, that keeps those from interfering and shooting. And then a pinhead being referred to as the ability to hit the pin, the head of a pin at, you know, whatever distance as a shooter. <laughs> so it's about accuracy. <laughs> It's it's uh it's pretty fun and again you know I pointed out that jungle wood scene, a lot of car s sequences which really? can be really hard to draw. He's a great designer like you know he he creates 
a very full world and he has those other art books like Intron Depot and, and, and stuff like it where he's just developing these giant worlds and what what happens is these books become the Bible that is used for the animators and the people right. making the movies and shit. So it's it's this very, very rich thing. I want to read this uh, footnote. So they're getting ready. They're you know, out on their mission or whatever, and she's gearing up. And then the footnote is, after this, there's a scene where Mako- Makoto takes over the driving, and Tagusa checks his gear and puts it on, but it was too much of a hassle to draw, so I left it out. That's my favorite, <laughs> that's my favorite footnote. <laughs> I love that stuff. He's... This character is that is that what what's his name? Uh, T- Togusa. Yeah, we get his arc. His arc is is a little bit of connective tissue that takes you through every issue because because he starts off as like a he's relatively new to the team. He's coming from the police background, doe eyed rookie. Yes, and then he becomes toward the, and he's a more seasoned vet talking smack on the rookies. Yes, yeah, good 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 note, Ed. This is a great uh, sequence that was con- that was used in the actual, uh, in the first animated film that I like a lot, where these two garbage men, they're on a route, they're doing some stuff. Homeboy's talking about his wife and daughter and uh, the problems he's having domestically at home and they have to go make these calls and he's able to, you know, hack into her stuff, which, by the way, like, in Edward Snowden times, uh, he revealed that... And this would make perfect sense, right? Like the NSA having all that power and access to everybody's Facebooks and stuff. They actually have a term called love int, love intelligence for the people in the NSA who use company property to snoop on their their wives or potential love interests and right. suitors. And that's like what he's doing here. He's He's got he's ghost hacking his wife, sort of illustrating the problems at home. He's trying to make shit right. But it turns out that He's being played like uh, like a puppet because the puppeteer is the villain that uh, that keeps us going throughout the whole series. I want to point out these little crows that are all around the garbage. When the garbage explodes, you see them flying out. They're total cartoons. They're, like there's a bunch of this stuff that that goes between you know super detailed cars or weapons or whatever technical stuff, and then it cuts to complete cartoon characters. And I love that. That did- was another thing that when I first read this, it was like. I hadn't seen that very much. And yeah. we've called it out on people like Sam Keith or somebody that, you know, has this cartoonish element as part of their language and vocabulary. But it's not common and it wasn't at least it wasn't common to the stuff I was reading. So that really appealed to me when I was reading this for the first time and being like, Oh wow, you know, that's a pretty uh broad vocabulary that he's drawing from. They lose that in all of the translations uh in multimedia of Ghost in the Shell, and it becomes just this like dead serious uh, cyberpunk epic. Now, when this came out, like, and there was that little mini comic in Wizard Magazine, it seemed culturally here in the States, like, there was a push to get everybody hip to to manga. And, and it might have even been that same issue of Wizard. It surely came very close after, but it was like a Scott McCloud article called Understanding Manga. And he was talking about the idiom of the big tear mm-hmm. on the face and when the characters zap into these super cartoony forms. It was an effort to hip us to this this new kind of idea of what, what comics are and how comic storytelling uh, goes. Word Balloon, which just squiggles in the line, where uh, Major and, and Tagusa are kind of getting on each other's nerves. And the footnote about the conversation where uh, the major wonders if it's a mistake bringing in an ex-police guy because she believes the ability to sniff out criminal activity, which she calls ghost whispering, happens by intuition and cannot be acquired through training or experience. So what you were saying about, you know, his arc joining this team, being the rookie, is exactly what's playing out here. Is like he, he needs to prove himself in her eyes. And you kind of hear this about like special forces teams where you really are trusting your life with each other. And that bond becomes exceptionally strong, but, you know, kind of through fire, right. trial by fire. You know, it's not it's not just because you're assigned to the team, so we're going to trust this guy. You need to see him uh, showing and proving. Right. Great sequence. Uh, of Like, that. it's probably one of the more, more mem- memorable moments in the comic uh, for me, because there's some tragedy to it whenever they get hold of that trash man and let him know that it's all fugazi. 
uh, you could you could see his heartbreak, and it makes sense that that sequence would also carry over into that original anime. So these robots that are chasing this guy, they're uh, part of the team. They're like AI robots. Fuchikoma is is their names throughout. They're kind of like these walking tanks that can do all kinds of surveillance and follow and weapons and backup and stuff like that. They carry on throughout. They're part of the uh, you know part of the support team for sure, man. When you're playing a PlayStation game, you're not playing as Major Kusanagi. You're you're one of the tanks. More great weaponry. Very dynamic stuff. Wow, those those speed lines. You're you're not going to find very many pages that don't have them. Yeah, this is a. Despite all the text, it's it's a very fast paced story most of the time. Jimmy, man, like. It takes forever to learn how to make a good comic page, period. And then how do you how do you then design amazing looking helicopters that you see in many different views and I was angles? Say, right, yeah, turn this thing around front, back, close ups. It's it's really uh I mean clearly it's the work of a guy, you know, we say graphomania, but you know, even like this interior design is spectacular and it's a quarter of a page or something. Yeah. Not exactly throwaway, but practically. Except for how good it looks. Man, and anytime you have a chance, let's drop weapons under both arms. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could see why the, why his work would be some of the earliest kind of manga to come to the States. Because it was stuff that we could understand, like robots, guns, paramilitary. More of the cartoony stuff. This stood out to me on my first reading. There are several of these chapters that end, and it's like cartoony versions of the characters. Almost like Chiba-like versions of these characters. Uh, you know, reflecting, joking around, some kind of levity based on, you know, whatever happened in the previous story. If, and then this is fun. This is the robots talking about having a revolution and an uprising, the AI, which the, the main characters do acknowledge. Like, this is a concern. If you have AI running around, like, yeah, there could be an issue. Um, but it's played definitely for laughs as they're sort of arguing about how, what do they want? They're well taken care of. They don't really, <laughs> there's no reason for them to revolt. But kind of a funny... Not even a subplot, but just a funny acknowledgement. And I, I imagine it's the uh, the creator thinking, just thinking about it. You know, what do they do in their off hours, the robots? Because <laughs> we see the main characters in their off hours. So what are these intelligent robots doing? Yeah, the uh, the little cartoon ending, uh, to me, it's it's like at the end of like a full, a full house or something. Then they go to commercial. And when they come back before the credits, you have that one little zinger. And that's the zinger panel. This this subnote talks about AIs with prosthetic bodies and then speculates on like hunger, sexual desire, desire to sleep, all these things of like well, how would that work? He you get, know, it's really like heady kind of like fun. I, I you know, I assume it's the author just enjoying this thing he's interested in and, and kind of thinking about it in that way. This would this would have to fit into the bracket of what what they call hard hard sci fi, where they're, it's they're, tr they're trying to root it in uh, in actual science as much as possible. Uh, even though it's projecting, projecting forward, and on top of the AI stuff, it's um, he's talking about what some of the some of the issues would be with just cybernetics in general. Like the reason you and I feel pain when when we are strained to like lift something is because it's our body telling us that we're we're sort of hitting our limit. Well, what if you don't have that? Right. You know, like, what if you don't have... And there are people who who have diseases where, the, where they don't have it, and their hips are malformed. It's and amazing. Yeah, he talks about, like... Because everybody has some augmentation, or lots of people have some augmentation. Maybe not a full robot body, but an arm. And it'll it'll just rip rip it out of the socket. Like, where it becomes, like, uh, regular human tissue, It the, the arm can lift way more than the human tissue that's connecting it can. And you have to sort of figure that out, or else you would just rip your sockets apart. There, there was a guy on, on Rogan who was a famous uh, surfer, and he broke his ankle so many times that... Or I think... He broke his ankle so many times it just never got it set, so it looks like a little tree trunk. It just keeps growing. <laughs> but the thing happened to something happened to his knee that he couldn't ignore, and they rebuilt his knee, titanium knee, and he's like, "Oh, it's better than yeah. than uh, you know bones." And he asked the doctor, "Like, what can I do with this?" And and the doctor said, "Please, like, don't do anything you wouldn't do right. with a regular knee." Because yeah, give that guy, to the next athlete. <laughs> <laughs> because he has you know no threshold of pain. And will push all limits. And he said that you know, like he, he's continued to push. It. He he got into he got an injury, and then his leg looked all gnarly because he got a dent in his fucking titanium knee. Jeez, 
Jeez, imagine <laughs> what that is to bone. Whatever causes a dent in a titanium knee. Um, this is a cool sequence. I, I didn't want us to skip over this without acknowledging it, but this is the building of a cyborg body. Yeah. And so, like, you get some of the amazing drawing. You can see, like, why anybody who's trying to draw comics would get hold of this and just love it. You know, like, like just study this thing for years and years. Um, Look at this, everybody, man. Like, in the 90s, like, when this came out, there was a famous uh, T-shirt company called Hookups, and it would be all anime chicks with, like, these nun outfits and, you know, bunny ears and stuff. It's totally just like a hookup shit. And it's, it's of this time, and it's perfect. The, um, the major, this is her. You know, it's not her character that they're building, but this is where we get to learn that, like, she is just a brain and a spinal column. Yeah. Like, she's one of these rare, full prosthetic body types, which, um, you know, you mentioned not a lot of characterization, and there's a little bit, probably as we go on, like, towards the end, I think, is when we see her evolve a little bit. But it does inform her character in that she's better than everybody else. Right. And probably a, a big part of that is because of that cyborg, you know, prosthetic body that she's uh, that she has. And once again, we could root, root this in our current times also because uh, they've they've made great advancements in in f facial re restructuring, reconstruction. And uh, there's psychological components to that in, in real life now like when if your face gets eaten by a chimpanzee and they build a new face for you and it's not the face that you recognize for the past 40 years there are issues yes you know and it's a, it's a brand new psychological phenomenon that that's that's sort of trying to be healed all right man this is great so she's getting hacked to basically try to attack this guy yeah and, and, and he just... has his you know like his bodyguard people that are these cyborgs Look at this stuff, man, where the cyborgs are opening up with, with their weapons and things. Parts of the flesh are being torn away, blown away. And then these effects of like, how do you simulate the being hacked or whatever? This book is full of this kind of stuff where it's like, how do you draw, you know, two brains interacting? And there's all kinds of different stuff that Shiro does. But that's another one of those visual tour de forces of like, if you just went through and made a supercut of all the panels of like, you know, two two entities interacting in this mental sphere... The, the, it's incredible. It's it's very inventive. Um, you know the stuff that he's doing to try to represent that, to try to represent something that's invisible, represent that visually in a comic. And so we get to see lots of that throughout. But I, I thought that was a really cool sequence. And then again, you know, any chance for ultra violence, even the stuff that involves a robot, it still has that visceral effect of like, you can see it being just shredded, torn apart. These bodies, robots that bleed, <laughs> and then all the super cool. Everything's just super cool in this. It is, man. He like he, he really puts the use that that um that blendy uh gradient uh zipatone. I think these are recalled robots, right? Like they they're are. catching robots that are going rogue or whatever. What a great visual that is. Harkens back to that famous issue of Spawn. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that set off that that one robot girl was like uh, that that big fat guy was just asking her to what the sweat off his brow and she wasn't having none of that like look at that guy that's like straight out of some Guillermo del Toro you know Pan's Labyrinth type shit cyberpunk doctor guy yeah the robot violence is almost more visceral than the human vi the human body violence stuff yeah it's almost all robot to robot this is this is uh, a great sequence because he sees geography, like he knows where everything is. So we're having this shootout and it feels like the geography of it all makes sense. Like he clearly sees, you know, the alleys that these guys could run into. He builds it in earlier. Um, it's a, it's a very well laid out storyboard of, of a uh, gunfight. Yeah, it is. And then his footnote is about that. It's about how, Tagusa was supposed to lay down cover for Bateau, and because he didn't, it cost them a few steps. He even talks about, like, whenever he has a rifle shooting somebody, he's careful not to show the sound effect until after, because a lot of times the bullets travel faster than the speed of sound. <laughs> That's a bizarre note. You know he, what I mean? Like, you're reading that, and it's it's I, I, it really just feels like a guy who's sitting in his room drawing this stuff 20 hours a day with just, like... Who knows what, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning of three days without sleep, and it just made sense to him to put that note in or something? The, I mean, the whole book is, 
just his full immersion into this world. Yeah, yeah. And, and and that translates to me as a reader. Like, I feel like I'm in this world. It's so conceived. Absolutely. But the problem is, like, in the real world, you know, we, you could drop us into New York City and, and we don't know, you know, what's a good neighborhood, like, how, how to act or whatever, but you start to pick it up. You sort of, there's so much here that you, you never really pick it up. You, you pick up, like, the two or three main things. You know what a ghost is. You know what ghost hacking is. You know what the puppeteer is. But everything else... You just have to accept. You just have to sit back, fly on the wall. You're a witness to this stuff happening. And once again, if it didn't look as beautiful as it does, I don't think you would earn my time as a, as a reader. That's one of the interesting things reading this. The art is the reason that we all know it, but the story's there. Like once you start digging into it, it may be hard at times to follow or, you know, really far out in terms of, of concept, but rewarding once you dig in mm -hmm. and weirdly those comments do help you know like they give it a certain grounded i don't know sense that there's a person somewhere with you like guiding you through this like don't worry i'll keep you up to speed you know if, if you don't totally get something it's all right i'll, I'll be here that's that's one of the advantages of this kodansha uh book because the bibliography like the stuff yeah, in the, the notes the notes are in the back right and you have to sort of remember like they're, they're more sparse. Honestly, you would need a note for every single page <laughs> to, to make a perfect sense of it, but, you know, whatever. There are sequences where it feels like there are notes on every page. Um, you know, like reading it, it can be a... It, it's extremely dense. It can be a lengthy experience. That's incredible. Like, any of the robotic mechanical stuff it always all feels like shines. It, yeah, it always feels like it works, you know? It's... it's I imagine that he's looking at the undercarriage of an uh, airplane or something to see what kind of tech goes in there, and then he just makes it work for himself. This footnote talks about um, kind of like cells forming you know, tissues, organisms, human bodies, and the idea of these complexities, all the way up to things like spirit and God. That is a, a theme that comes through this. You know, like what actually represents a cell for an individual um, you know, once you've replaced bodies several times, once you've transferred consciousness, you know, downloaded it, it, it's, it's kind of an interesting, probably now more interesting even than when this was invented, but it's, it's one of those things that comes through this several times. And as we build towards climax is going to become a bigger and bigger point for the major. Uh, but that idea of like what defines who we are, right? See, this is some of that stuff of like, how do you represent these more abstract concepts? <laughs> next to the gun with the brass catcher. You know, without brass catcher, with brass catcher, and then what does that do? <laughs> so, it's, so it's... Two pages after the concept of, like, how, you know, cells connect to gods. It's, it's exceptional stuff, man. There's, there's nobody else like this. And then follow that up with a gorgeous helicopter. Soviet-era sci-fi version of a future Soviet helicopter. This is, um... This story is sets on these like northern Japanese islands that are kind of off the coast of, of Russia and I guess they're disputed territories between Japan and Russia throughout history and so it's almost a nether world of you know arms dealers and, and tech outlaw tech companies so they have to go in there to get some information and retrieve somebody and as they get in there are people working there that they know that they have passed with especially the major uh you know, again, just building this world, you know, mm -hmm. it's just the sense of this world. Like you have these players that have these histories. I hate to compare it to somebody like Cable and Marvel, but you know, when that character shows up and then you'd hear like, oh yeah, he, he and Wolverine know each other. You get a sense of that. Like this is a world that has this history. And if uh, Shiro had wanted to go in that direction, he could tell a story that's set 20 years before this. Yeah. It makes you wonder what kind of work he did ahead of time before putting pencil to paper um, on, you know, page one of the comic. Look at that, man. Amazing. Like, that panel, we could spend an episode on this panel. You know what I'm going to say? Like, Even as, the throwaway foreground character that's part robot and part punk. As a as a uh, singular creator... That could be a James O'Barr character. Totally. Right yeah, uh, Danzig or whatever. Even the from, eye from, from, uh, looks obar -ish. Or Zeitgeist. <laughs> uh, you look at this compared to an Akira panel. And with the Akira panel, this background stuff would be thin tech pen... That's completely divorced from the the character artwork because Otomo did the character artwork and some assistant did, you know, the background. But this is, it's like the first time you get to see 
a manga of this kind of subject matter of popular subject matter we'll say because you know once again Gero um but it's all congruent artwork you know it's not like an issue of Oishinbo we're looking at there where it's like you have the characters look one way and then you have this super ornate perfect looking sushi or those baseball manga right. where you have the characters are cartoony and then you see a baseball glove and it's like that baseball glove on that guy's hand was not drawn by the guy who drew that right. character it's it's all one one cohesive well in terms of art <laughs> unit This is the, uh, the like the programmer person that Major has history with, and like his sex, his little harem, outdated uh, sex robots that he's updating and keeping. <laughs> Shades of Dawn and Matrix. <laughs> this is still very much in that procedural kind of uh, you know style. Right. The, but there's a crime. There's a character they're after. We're going to get, you know, a sense of closure to this chapter, even if it sets up, you know, continues to set up things with Puppeteer and the ongoing storyline. As we progress towards the end of this this book, and we're a couple chapters away from it, it becomes a little different, less procedural, and, and more about this character, and more about what I remember from reading this. You know, like like on the rereads, it's always, what do I remember? Um, most of what I remember is later, you know, it's mm -hmm. like the end parts. Here's more examples of this, like, how do we show this stuff that really doesn't have a visual, uh, you know, any kind of obvious... You can't photo reference this. Right. You know, this is stuff that you've got to invent. Man, the action, though, it's it's really special. Yeah, for sure. In those last, I'd say, like, three chapters, uh, they, they really... It, it's, it's, one, it's one story. It's different facets of, like, one bigger story. His character designs, like, the faces and stuff are amazing. Yeah, even her clothes are, are very fun. We see her in several outfits throughout this, and uh, from operational kind of stuff like the like the tech flak, flak jackets and stuff to you know having to go to a party or or be more formal formal wear. I love seeing these these tanks uh, because it's you know when they talk about some of the innovations of Star Wars, some of the innovation was just like adding dirt to robots and junk, and these are very organic lines. That, that he draws for for this this tech stuff and it makes it feel battle battle worn and like you know it's been around for a while yeah they're beautiful another hookups yeah, I can say more of your t-shirts <laughs> more hookups chicks this is just wild stuff when, when the I, tech controls the diagrams the brain scans like a like a holographic brain scan. If if I was to do my version of like art school confidential, the archetypes would be different, and and it would be like there would be people who could make good pages of comics, and then there would be the dudes who can just do incredible character designs, a dude who could do like incredible monster designs, uh, another guy who's interested in tech stuff, and Shiro has it all, you know. But also very dense. It's 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 super dense, and I would say that the writer part of Shiro's like takes a back seat. You know, to just this world building thing. It's, it's really hard to put so much information. He's communicating so much. You know, like like you go 350 page book or something, but also huge world with history, futures, many characters, all these tech ideas. So what happens here is an assassination attempt on her. Uh, an assassin shows up to the door, and then he's wired with these explosives that are compared to C4, and I guess actually maybe C4, although yeah, and they describe at, it as something else elsewhere. And look at how mean out it is. that apartment level. Look at how mean that is, yeah, man. Yeah, screws embedded in it. What yeah. a detail. Yeah, and uh, in, the, in the Dark Horse version, it's like box of 200 nails, or you know, in English it, it'll say that. That's really dark and detailed. Yeah. So, of course, this is a big deal. Team responds instantly, runs to the hospital. And this is really the beginning now of this story, mm -hmm. this endgame story. In the hospital, um, she survived and her partner survived. I don't know if partner's the right word because it's not like they're married, but they've been dating for a while. And he's with another government agency. Uh, I mention that because both of them checked each other out, you know, in terms of what their government agency could, could dig up on each other to make sure they're uh, above board. And then, you know, both of them are right, ready to go to work and, like, figure out who did this and get them. Dude, I had... Uh 
in, in my old house, my next door neighbor worked worked for you know the government at a nuclear power plant. There's and, one of those uh, cartoon shorthands. Yeah, for sure. The and the feds would would come to our house uh, every two years or so, knocking on the door, asking if if you know are, are they on the up and up. And uh, you know, I would tell my pops, man, don't don't even talk to them, man. Don't don't <laughs> don't rank on the, on our neighbors. We mentioned the car chases earlier and how hard that stuff is to draw. This sequence, so. Tagusa is driving her to wherever they're going to, you know, look for something or they have a lead on something. But it's like, turn left, turn left again, hang a left. And then down here is the note on how this is a, a way to expose a tail. Yeah. So it's not just drawing a car sequence that needs to make geographic sense on a page. It's also like very specifically a sequence to, uh, you know, that would be used. Incredible, man. Who, 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 have you ever seen anything like that in any comic? Yeah, no, like the closest to the procedural stuff that that I could think of and it's more comical is uh is Chester Gold would hang out with the cops in Chicago and would get this the steez on how to do a lot of that stuff but nothing that detailed of course so they pull into kind of an abandoned warehouse area and the car that's tailing them is loaded for bear and right behind them and they have no backup for a while homeless people living there chance for him to show off his ability to do character design Yet another type of character design. Those people factor in throughout the story, man. Like in a very small way, there's 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 a class component because when we saw those trash men, there were uh, homeless people sleeping amongst that, and you know they dispersed those homeless people in the same way that they dispersed the crows, just you know spraying special stuff on them. So so that factors in. Like in a in a world where there are cybernetics, or like let's let's say. Let's say the Fountain of Youth is discovered or Eternal Life. You and I ain't getting it. Jeff Bezos is going to get that shit before we do. You know, it's a great... That's a good... Uh, I'm glad you say it, Ed, because that is a big part of this world. Like, yeah. like we are seeing that, and there are haves and have-nots, and it's part of Major's advantage is that she has this top-of-the-line body that most people don't get or can't afford, and that is who they're chasing or the people who sort of can afford it, but you do have to show the, the class that doesn't get it in order to make that make sense. And, I mean, economic... As much as like all the sci-fi stuff we're used to seeing, he's also mapped out that economic component of this world. Yeah, and that's a big part. Like money's changing hands. Gold, uh, you gold know, bars are being discovered. Crimes. Yeah, there's all that stuff. So this is a great action sequence. One of the things that was in the truck that we're chasing her is this this mech unit, this like tank, and uh, that's how they track down like what's going on because there aren't very many of these in the world. This is a very high tech weapon, a very deadly weapon, and so they track down like you know how somebody got hold of that this would be like a um like a high level american weapon it's a new we'll call it a nuclear bomb yeah and, yeah you and can trace like, like where did it come from yeah like if if you find one of those you know in uh in lawrenceville you better you better connect some dots so they end up meeting again you remember this is her partner from uh started out in the apartment then the hospital their two units are tracking each other and it's like what is going on here and again it kind of goes back to there's corruption within the system. Yep. And uh, that's going to lead them. That's going to advance this this convoluted plot a little bit further along. But pretty rough. You know, like she has her arm blown off. This thing's practically unstoppable that has a has a definite villain, bad guy, one, you know, someone on the wanted list that's after her. Someone that they tried to kill and he got away. And so now he's back for payback, but funded by the state operator. Man. And with and with all their technology and everything, like they're still chasing this guy called the puppeteer that they still know nothing about. And she just cool executes that dude. When she finally gets the drop on him from, from his tank, someone throws her a gun and she wastes no time. Bye bye terrorist. And moving on, man. Let's let's uh figure out what exactly is going on. That's foreshadowing uh Shiro's future career when he's just drawing those pinup ladies. <laughs> he spent years and years just doing just this that stuff. Oh man, this, this, some of these ideas towards the end are just really intense. Yeah, this is a so they have this robot captured and they have this super hacker, this puppeteer trapped in her, I don't know, mind, in her circuitry in her mind, whatever. But they basically have this highly dangerous character they've been chasing is trapped in this what's left of this robot body and different people show up so this is another government agent operative shows up with his own doctor who's part cyborg 
And you see him like going going to town with that you, you his s- robot hands. You see that animated in the in the first flick, and it's it's really really cool. And this stuff doesn't add up, you know. Lots of corruption. These government agents agencies aren't really talking to each other. They're they're telling each other minimum of what they need to know to uh, get access to trade info, but nothing extra. And so, in the midst of this, with nobody trusting each other, there's there's a bomb. I don't know if it's the robot that goes off or if it's it's a bomb around them. You know, like like again, somebody infiltrating this. Nothing safe, and it creates this situation of puppeteer trying to escape and everybody going after it and trying to flush each other out as to like who's responsible for this who can you trust nobody of course wouldn't, it wouldn't be cyberpunk if you could trust anyone right there are there are uh i think about um the video game series metal gear solid is a very very complex and challenging in terms of of the story and it's the only other kind of story that i could think of that's as challenging with this kind of subject matter the difference being this is just shiro not a team of programmers and you know designers as if all of this isn't hard enough to draw cars being chased by these helicopter planes and through the streets let's add some rain yeah so now you've got reflections of vehicles and splashes coming up whenever they cut the corners throwing down the the spike tracks to stop the cars car accidents it is just every spread feels like it has something hyperdynamic happening and now when they finally get this robot back it's breaking down and so she ends up diving in and essentially like taking on some of that the puppeteer's program well it, like it's it's discovered that like the puppeteer it's it's not a guy it's 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 AI. artificial intelligence it's just a program and dude once again that is a projection of like what some of the stuff is going to happen in real in real life in Windows XP era, if you got a new computer and you hooked it up to the internet, and if you did not download Service Pack 2, immediately, within two minutes, you would get what's called the Sasser worm that's endemic to the internet. Somebody released a worm on the internet that is out there that we are now protected from, but for a moment we weren't. And if you connected to the internet, you would be hacked in two seconds if you had an unprotected Windows box. This is 1989. This is before that. Yeah. And this is some of the highlight drawings of... The, of how do you draw this stuff? Right? Like, this is wild visuals. Yeah, like, what is synapses? It's almost um, like a Doctor Strange or something, you know? Yeah. Praised by, for, for Ditko drawing these, like, realms and, and weird things that don't really exist in a physical way. You have that same thing here a generation or two later of, like... How do you represent this stuff? You know, I mean, look at that as a spread. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's wild. There This got Imagine me... this is your submission pages to somebody. <laughs> Here's my proposal. This got me into like reading more about about uh Henry Darger as as weird as that may sound because um it's it's two bodies of work by people who just kind of kept to themselves and and just just created worlds, man, and I can't help but think that there's like some connection to that man like this guy he developed this world and he just is launching in like he's spending time with it you know it's it's when we were talking about chris claremont talking to chris claremont and he would talk about his characters like he would talk about them as they were like real people or something and you get the feeling that this guy you know like he would rather just jack out of you know the world that you and i share and just launch right back into exploring this place this is her pretty much connecting with this puppeteer yeah. to some level. And we don't totally understand it. She doesn't totally understand it. And then being like brought back and, and woken up after the fact, how much time, you know, again, don't know. You know, she lost it. We lost it. Is she the same now? You know, like what, what exactly is going on with this character? Don't know. We'll see. <laughs> and now we're back to another one of these missions. And on this mission... Man, this book is just loaded with stuff. This is another Kirby thing where it's like there are ideas on every page. They're they're working on this sub, but the sub is a cyborg. (laughs) Unbelievable, right? Yeah. And and back to your, you know, your sequence of like climbing on board of this thing. 
And so she gets in trouble right here. She gets the drop on this character that they're after and just executes her. Yeah, and the shit is caught on film. Right. And this is going to be, it's almost a frame job for her. And so she kind of becomes... Um, Fugitive number one, man. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Because she goes through a trial. There's public, there's a huge public response to this of like, what What are these government operators? They just go around and they kill people. No, no trial, no anything. So there's like this public backlash against their section. It's all falling apart. And it's, you know, it's, they're being framed essentially. And she knows that they know that. And so she goes off the grid as this fugitive and uh, kidnaps a top level uh, diplomat or somebody like that. You know what? I love this explosion too. Just the brushwork there, the the big heavy brushwork. Yep. So she uh, she kind of has to go off the grid to try to figure this out, to draw out the person who's responsible for all of this, which I don't know if they even ever do. Like they just kind of swerve off in her. They fought. We follow her, but I don't know if we actually get a resolution to whoever's behind. You know gunning for them and sabotaging them. I think there's some question about her shooting that guy too, if that's puppeteer pulling strings right. and manipulating the whole situation. But it ends with this big hostage showdown where she has this diplomat guy. I forget what she's after, but whatever it is, you also have loose cannons on the other side, like working for the police. You know, it's such an espionage like story where there are several of these groups. Everybody's doing their own thing. People are double agents. You don't know what you're actually seeing and uh, what we end up seeing is one of these guys takes a shot, kills her. That's the end of her body. Maybe that's the end of her. Bateau is watching this from a distance. And, uh, and we see, all right, it looks like this all worked. Let's get out of here. That's, uh, that's the major. Yeah, it's just like a little brain in a jar. Yeah, I love it. It's like sitting on a pillow in the back seat. <laughs> It's so funny. <laughs> but off they go, you know, and like she's kind of now separated physically from the world, at least to some extent. The world believes she's been killed. Like, you know, her identity, at least the way we recognize her up to this point of the story, is gone. And so he goes off to find her a body in a safe house that he has, but the safe house has been compromised. And, uh, you know, these punks or whatever have kind of broken in, tried to steal things. This is something that goes on this was a would have been a potential safe body but like funguses and things grow on it because there is organic material right again like that's your detail and that, this is spoken of early on whenever they're talking about some of the technologies they talk about this kind of stuff or organic computers uh are, are a thing <laughs> how weird is <laughs> <laughs> google gobble neurosystems that's pretty great drawing. Reminds me of that Bodies exhibition. I don't know if you saw that a oh, few yeah. years ago where it was like plastic for all the different, uh, I guess, for blood vessels. And they, they inject plastic into human tissues and blood vessels to, to preserve them. So what is happening here is inside of her, the puppeteer is having this conversation with her. And that's denoted by a different font. So yeah. that's very helpful visually so that we can keep up with what's going on. But he kind of talks about propagation and this idea that DNA is coding mm -hmm. and that we propagate and spread that around and it, it creates, you know, slightly new models, even though we're preserving some of that DNA coding as, as we keep that alive. And this AI has the same impulse of spreading, of staying alive. And so the AI's idea is to bond with her. And she's like, all right. <laughs> she answers very quickly. Like she's on board for it. It even surprises him. You know, like he's like, what? I thought it was going to take like, you know, eight and a half minutes to convince you of this or whatever. And so they bond together. And then again, this is the, your visual. Right. How do you show, how do you show neurons? Like yeah, the, what? the big bang. Consummating or something. Uh, and then she starts to come out of it. And when she wakes up, she's in this other body. So Batu has succeeded in like, you know, planting her, finding a body for her, planting her into this body. She's waking up, sees him. And uh, it could be a new life. Looks like my mom in the 1980s. <laughs> that haircut. That is the most timely part of this whole thing. <laughs> so futuristic, except the haircut. My mom had that King Louis. That's hilarious. And she walks off. You know, it's a new world. And, and she kind of, you know, that's what your text is expressing is like seeing this world in a new way. Quite sure. Like the next, the next books, uh, at least I think the very next one is her and the puppeteer merged and adventures involved in that but uh when this was collected in uh the dark horse version 
there's this updated, yeah, I want to see if it's there and it's not. So like, let's show this off because this is, this is a great snapshot in the tools of the trade that she, that Shiro had, had access to like during the, the making of this thing, man. So we have, you know, that's Photoshop and that's a computer with a graphic user interface, a, a, a big tower, Xerox machines. I don't know what that is. You know is. what? Just to clarify, that's a that's a Photoshop predecessor. Oh, is it? You know, like it wouldn't have been around in, in ninety. I'm not sure. Did, no, was... this this is that's a PlayStation, so that's like uh, ninety five. Gotcha. Or, yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's would have been around in ninety five. Yeah. Sure. You see the mug? Like they don't have the drafting tables you and I do. Like they have 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 these like little tabletop things. I think you know space is a premium in, in Tokyo or whatever. But yeah, PlayStation One. Uh, what is some of the other like? Is that a record player? Yeah. Is that a photocopy machine? This is a photocopy machine, but what's that small thing? Yeah, I think that's got to be a record Flatbed player. scanner, like the ones wow. that with the serial port that you had to screw in. That yeah, took, I remember this. It took, took all night <laughs> took to scan something in. scan something. Ugh. Wow. How cool is that, right? Because he doesn't take photos. Like, I think you might be able to... He's like uh, Thomas Pinchon. Like, you might find a photo or two, but not not very many very reclusive kind of cat in fact masamuni shiro is not his real name right an eccentric yeah wow um i have to show off so the kadansha box set has uh ghost in the shell 1.5 which is i think procedurals i haven't read these yet mm -hmm. and the ghost in the shell 2 um so three books are in that in that box set but this is uh, a couple of issues from the sequel comic and uh, I wanted to bring these for a few reasons. One, to kind of show off just what this stuff looks like. All the color work is being done digitally. And you can see, um, you know, you can see how far along it is compared to, say, what we see in, in Ghost in the Shell 1, you know, in terms of just digital collage, probably 3D stuff. Just a lot of advancement from a guy who obviously is in, into this, and this is the direction he ultimately goes after this. But... It's not all digital. So we have digital color, but he also slips into, you know, black and white stories. And the black and white is your traditional, you know, line work kind of drawing. And of course, there are bridges to that. So stuff that is part color and then sliding into that black and white, I guess, real world is is what this represents, you know, versus, versus the more virtual kind of uh, color segments. Still amazing, but... I don't know. This might be the last comics that he actually does is this Ghost in the Shell 2. Yeah, they did describe that he he just disappears for, for a time and he makes his, makes his comic and delivers it. You know, you could also... You don't need the box set. You could just fi oh, yeah. find these comics, you know, soft covers. I don't know that there's much more uh, added bonus material in, in, in the box set or anything. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, but he, you know, he goes off... And he does his whimsy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious, and I, we never kind of cracked that code talking to Felipe Smith or whenever I went out to Japan to, to talk to different people about, you know, the very rigorous schedule that they put themselves on and, like, the Naruto guy, or, like, say, One Piece, which is, like, the number one Shonen Jump comic right now. They puts out about three or four trades a year of, of 200-page volumes a piece a year, right? And uh, it's the most successful thing. It's launched multimedia properties very successful anime toys video games you don't have to do that you don't have to you're a, you're a mega multi-millionaire now you don't have to like and so masamuni shiro it's almost an american approach or so like where it's like he's got his hits and and they're bringing in like they these are every comic he's made is an asset to him they're all paying dividends to this day it's in a million languages uh it's a perennial you could go to any comic shop and find some masamuni shiro stuff so he's licensed to death yeah, animes he... tv shows movies video games so he works a manageable amount that you and i could 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 work uh that's that's another atypical thing for his process compared to the other manga because because for whatever reason culturally or otherwise when somebody has a hit they feel like they got to keep, you know, you only get to sleep five days a week and, hmm. and all of that. So when it, in real life, it's like, you, you don't, really don't have to. You're good. You're good forever now. Your family's good forever. This is not, this one is not uh, flipped, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I guess that maybe that's the uh, sexy part about the uh, trade. 
I, I mean, the, the box set. You know what? I don't know if the box set is flipped either. Like, maybe this is not is not uh, designed to be flipped. I mean, at this point, like, clearly it, it'd be whatever he wants it to be, right? Yeah. So he may have designed it this way. This, I think, there's an anime that's kind of based on this that's a little bit more procedural. Mm -hmm. And it's a series, like 60 episodes, 70 episodes, something like that. So, yeah, this stuff is, is all over the place. Mileage probably varies in what is the most audience friendly entry points you know um the stories are certainly different in the different media adaptations um it's incredible though what a mythology and that original book is just unlike anything i've read you know as a reading experience completely unique absolutely man i couldn't say it better than that get out of here yeah i think that's all i have all right k favors like follow subscribe to the youtube channel hit the bell we'll notify you when the next vids are available october is in, in shop still so get your hands on a physical copy of that if you could find it uh patreon.com slash ed piscor three bucks to get you the archive to to the red room comics that i'm serializing issue one is up there right now you can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video you can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video Jim, give them some marching orders. Read more manga. <laughs> <laughs>